and the um, the practice um, is one in which we are uh, our goal is um, this Buddha um, Buddha nature Buddha uh, Buddha seeing Buddha knowing Buddha Buddha wakefulness so in the, in the chanting the one who knows the one who's awake um, and these are the qualities um, that we seek to to develop. I think that um, at the beginning of a meditation, at the beginning of a retreat, or at the beginning of each particular session of meditation, having um, a clear determination, um, having a, uh, a determination to um, attain a certain state may or may not be, be helpful for some people that may bring on um, craving and, and tension but I, I think that a, a skillful way of, of using this of aspiration in Aditan is, um, is always to um, move away from the idea of a state um, to be attained that is to say a result um, to the, the cause and, and the cause is mindfulness that I'm making a aditan or making a resolution to try for this whole period of meditation, say for an hour, um, to sustain mindfulness, for to be awake and clear for a whole hour, rather than you no, know, I, I want to in this meditation I, want, I need to attain a certain state of mind, but uh, concentrating on the causal state, the causal um, stage, and to. Um, to be mindful, awake, clear um, for a whole for a whole hour of inhalations and exhalations, or a whole two hours, or whatever. And this is this is one way of protecting um, the mind, not allowing um, chanda to uh, degenerate into tanha um, by concentrating on what you're doing rather than the result of it, and making your your effort, and your intention, and your um, aspiration based on action rather than on the results of actions and the uh, always to remember the, the ultimate um, goal of what we're doing as I say is this wakefulness this uh, awake, awakened state and uh, clear seeing and we develop samatha practice in order to stabilize the mind, to uh, to calm it, to clarify it, to energize it, um, in order to give it the ability to see clearly. And this is what you know, vipassana is a clear space, a special kind of seeing, uh, which can only take place in a mind which has been um, which has been well trained in calmness and in samatha. Without that. Um, samatha base the mind uh, just doesn't have the ability to stay with anything um, for very long doesn't have the ability to penetrate the surface of things it's always a superficial um, kind of knowledge um, it's the difference um, between say uh, if you open the, the back of a, um, a computer and somebody like me and just see all these you know um, colors and, and sort of um, intriguing kinds of connections and it uh, doesn't really mean anything but someone who's who's been well trained um, can see straight away what's going on and if you have a, a machine of any kind a, a mechanic um, just uh, he looks at it and you look at it and uh, your eyes are seeing the same objects but um, he sees that much more clearly than you and is very sensitive to if there's anything um, that's uh, abnormal or malfunctioning straight away and uh, he's been able to he sees things that you don't see because if, um, uh, he's trained the ability to look um, he knows his subject thoroughly and um, the uh, the ability to, to see to look and to see um, it's based on um, certain amount of called sutta, of, of what we may call book knowledge, um, but the ability to, to bring that to bear on the present moment um, is um, greatly 
conditioned by the, the calm and peace of mind that we that we have developed. This, so look at every sort of aspect of your of your being and your experience, and see this this conditioned nature. It's arising and passing away according to causes and conditions, and constantly bringing the mind back to this um, over and over again. And and as with any any kind of um, uh, meditation, any kind of reflection, that you you become skillful in it and you become successful in it through this constant application. And uh, it's it's not something you just maybe do once a month or once every couple of weeks or something, and 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 you can expect anything to come from it. It is something that every day. Um, constantly inclining the mind. So if you do a lot of samatha practice, then what happen, or can often happen is that outside of that, every now and again, the mind just rebels and it wants to think. As I've had enough of um, peace, I want, I want a bit of exercise and I want to um, have my own way. And sometimes, it, when you've got that kind of energy in your mind, um, if, you f- if you try to go against it too much, you get tense. And so th- that's the time for the conceptual kinds of meditations and to use the energy, well, that's what it is, it's an impersonal energy of mind, to incline it in a skillful and constructive way through this uh, kind of reflection on, on anatta. And as you, as you develop it on a conceptual level more and more, then it, it sort of sinks in and it seeps in. And, and then in meditation practice, in the mind, when the mind gets into more subtle levels, then its ability to recognize uh, conditioned nature of phenomena um, is, uh, has been trained and has been developed. So as you get calm and the mindfulness is stronger, you just, you just start to notice that as your mindfulness gets stronger and it gets faster, you know, it's there, then it seems like the, the objects that come into your mind slow down. Then there's like slow motion. You see, you see some kind of, kind of float into your vision and then it floats out again. And and you say, well, where did that come from? I mean, just just to see how how impersonal. Some perhaps it's a reaction to to a sound or a or a smell or a a sense object as as conditioned a mental object. And just to see an ob- uh, 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 a mental object, an aramana, as 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 an aramana, as uh, something floating in and out of the mind, and realizing that that you don't have to grasp onto it. You can just watch it and know it for what it is. And the stronger your mindfulness is, the more, the more easy it is to do that. But being able to see this, this, this body and this mind just as a, as a mass of, of, um, of conditioned phenomena. You know, so when you, when you put it into, into words, it kind of sounds a bit a bit intimidating, doesn't it? Or is it, well, who want to do that? You see, their body and mind is a massive condition phenomenon. Doesn't sound a very inspiring goal. But it's those are just pointers or arrows to to when you try and articulate, you know, what the experience of it is. But and the Buddha <coughs> says in the Dhammapada, seeing the arising, and passing away, of five khandas is, is bliss. It's a supreme happiness. So in spiritual life, um, these sort of changes take place, and and um, some of them can be um, unsettling um, because perhaps things don't change in the way that we expect them to, or things uh, suddenly change after a long period of of seeming to be um, just sort of um, at some kind of plateau um, or nothing very much happening. And then suddenly something quite um, unusual or strange happens and unprecedented. And where does that come from? So one of Ajahn Chah's um, sayings was, um, anything can happen. He said, when you start training your mind, anything can happen. And uh, this came up when he went to see um, the Ajahn on the mountain in the Konpanom. And I uh, was talking about his meditation practice and the nimitta that he was struggling with, in which he felt 
he was coming to a precipice and he just couldn't couldn't go any further and um, and uh, the the Ajahn he went to see um, said that's nothing there's all kinds of things that can that can happen even stranger than that and related how one time he was walking John Crom and then he found himself um, walking down into the ground and feeling himself step by step sinking sinking into the ground until he was completely submerged and then kept walking and then his body rose up through the earth through the ground and then went up right up into the up into the air into the treetops and then exploded and uh, he could see all his intestines hanging from the branches of the trees and he said so um, anything can happen when you're meditating and uh, just don't don't um, take it too seriously <laughs> <laughs> um, learning how to put forth that very steady um, practice uh, that Ajahn Chah always called Bhakti Bhakti Rui 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 means it's just there, it's very continuous and and uh, that's that's the trick, the secret more than anything else is continuity and constancy of practice rather than some great heroic effort for a week or two or even a, a pansar or two but being able to um, maintain that, that constancy um, and evenness of of effort and in the, in the meditation itself um, there's not one fixed way um, of, of practice there's not one fixed mode or, or even um, pattern of practice it does vary very much from from person to person. Um, one of the most um, clear or useful um, ways of talking about this is, is Ajahn Tanjan Mahabur's um, division into those for whom wisdom um, informs um, samadhi, or obram is the word, and uh, those for whom samadhi obram Banya or Samadhi informs Banya and uh, points out that uh, some people's minds are such that they can take um, a very simple object like a mantra uh, or the breath and apply themselves to that very, um, uh, very conscientiously and their mind will become calm eventually um, Whereas um, other people um, can't do that. Um, they're not able to calm their minds um, to a level where they go beyond the hindrances or into jhana with that simple, um, straightforward kind of technique, um, which, uh, which he calls samadhi or brambanya. Um, but they have to use the technique of Banya Obram Samati, which means that there needs to be um, reflection, um, investigation um, to help the mind to calm down. So that may be um, actually experimenting with more discursive meditations um, at some part of the day or at some period in practice. Um, or it may mean that um, when the mind uh, reaches a certain level of calm um, that uh, it's at that point which then there must be some investigation of Dhamma, it could be investigation of the body, um, investigation of um, uh, Four Noble Truths or whatever but to take the mind further into calm. So to speak in a more more technical way um, some some people um, practice with the meditation object um, and can go straight into Samadhi with the meditation object after the mind uh, is rested in Samadhi for a certain period of time it's full um, it's had enough rest, it's energized and um, you would say it withdraws from Apana Samadhi into Upajara Samadhi and in Upajara Samadhi the 
um, vipassana or investigation of Dhamma, the five khandhas, uh, can take place. Um, and the, the classic um, pattern here is that the investigation um, takes place for a certain length of time and then it's as if um, the mind becomes tired um, with the work of investigation and then it returns or is taken back into samadhi to rest in the apana samadhi and then withdraws again to do the work of vipassana. So this idea of apana samadhi um, as being a place of, of rest and accumulation of, of energy and, and power of mind and upajara on withdrawing from apana as the um, the time for investigation, this alternation between them. And this is the way that Ajahn Chah practiced. He had the, um, the samadhi or brum, um, banya um, mode in his own practice, I believe. Um, other, um, other people um, may reach the upajara level um, through uh, use of the meditation object, and then the mind won't go any further. It won't. It won't go into apana. It just. It just stays in that level, of pajara. And um, then um, our teachers tell us to, if a mind is of that nature, then to investigate at that point. So there are two two upajara samadhis is before apana and after apana. Now if, um, if the mind is, is, has a particular nature where um, it will only go into upajara, it won't go into apana, then the teachers say to develop the investigation of dhammas in the upajara. Um, for um, some meditators, um, that investigation um, will uh, lead be a cause for the mind to enter apana or jhana. For others, um, um, the vipassana may take place, and there are some individuals who um, can reach um, stream entry or stages of enlightenment um, in that upajara before apana. This is a, a view of um, I think all of the uh, Ajahn Man disciples that I that I'm conversant with, whether it's Ajahn Ajahn Mahabhu or Ajahn Ajahn Chah, um, Ajahn Tate, Ajahn Jua, and all these teachers will, will say that some some meditators um, uh, will the mind in the upajara stage will will go all the way without going into jhana. But um, for the mo- for, I think for the majority of people that the, um, the, the discipline of investigation in Upajara um, is not strong enough um, at that point to take the mind um, out of the world of um, the, the, the defilements into the uh, Lokutra stage, but will lead to the Apana, which will then go into Upajara. So this is the basic kind of overall picture that, that uh, is given in the teachers of the forest tradition. Um, they don't talk about first jhana, second jhana, third jhana, fourth jhana, um, hardly at all. Um, they talk about upajara and apana. And um, they also say that um, those who have the, um, the more investigative kind of mind meditation and um, so this is like an intermediate stage before going into the full apana which is just a very complete stillness um, bright stillness of mind complete um, mindfulness Um, and he says that the uh, or they say that the uh, some meditators may 
may doubt at this point whether their minds may, are not really calm because there is that background um, activity but they say that this is um, not something to worry about it's just that the the wisdom character is such that a certain level of samadhi uh, can coexist with thought whereas the the samadhi character the one the person who has this kind of gift just to concentrate and focus on something and go straight into the object the slightest um, arising of thought activity will will bring the mind out of that state it, it is kind of there's no tolerance of thought in that kind of mind um, whereas the the banya banya mind can be concentrated even with a slight amount of um, background noise that's it. so uh, this is uh, kind of advanced kind of stuff but I think it's it's uh, useful to have the um, overall um, picture laid out um, to give us some idea um, of the of the practice as a whole um, so working with the hindrances um, going beyond the hindrances a time when the five hindrances are not um, are not are no longer present and there's a knowledge and awareness that they're no longer present there's a sense of ease physical mental ease and a joy and 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 sense of uh, deep well-being at the realization that the hindrances are not present are not present just as in the similes I, I read out the other night this, the Buddha compared it to the joy of having been in debt and then having paid off all your debts and realizing you're no longer in debt or uh, having been um, very ill and then um, getting better and realizing that you're no longer sick that you're healthy at last that kind of uh, sense of well-being or of sense of having escaped from prison or being let out of prison or having been a, a slave and now being a free man or, or having been lost and um, in a very uh, desolate place and having found the, the way home these are the um, the similes the Buddha gave um, to explain this sense of this grace of joy and well-being the realization that there's no sensual desire no ill will no sloth and torpor no restlessness no um, no doubt in the mind so there's uh, the uh, most effortless um, uh, concentration and, and uh, awareness appreciation of the object accompanied with a sense of uh, focused energy and um, well-being rapture these, so these are the, the what we call the jhana factors that are present um, but are not yet um, very stable um, not they don't have the stability that they do when you go on to the next level of apana samadhi but as I said there are um, certain characters where they get to that upajara level and the mind won't go through uh, through mere concentration on an object um, it, it won't go any further and for that if you're of that nature and you have that kind of mind then that's the time to develop some um, investigation of uh, the three characteristics as an um, investigation of your present experience in the light of the three characteristics and this may give the the, uh, the impetus um, to carry the mind into apana or if you are a particularly gifted individual it might lead to uh, the vipassana that allows you to um, let go of attachments to the five khandhas at that um, particular level um, if the mind goes into apana samadhi um, and it does that by itself you don't have to force it and you shouldn't um, try to interfere with it in any way um, and depending on the power of your mindfulness the barami the uh, accumulation of samadhi um, it will stay in that state for a short or a longer time and then as it withdraws from the from that state is the point where um, there must be this firm intention to develop vipassana some some meditators as the mind withdraws from that very deep state of samadhi um, just think that's it that's the end of the meditation just want to finish I just want to go straight back into that state um, 
and it can lead to a sense of attachment to that. Um, another problem can be on, on the emergence from from that state of apana samadhi, then various very vivid nimittas can arise. So these nimittas and um, can be visual, audio, um, they're mind-made phenomena, um, but which seem um, extremely real. And they arise in upajara samadhi, either before or after um, this apana state. So coming out of apana samadhi, some meditators can have visions of heaven realms and hell realms and all kinds of things. Um, and it can be a, um, a temptation to absorb into them or to um, experience um, a very strong sense of um, faith and energy and other kind of wholesome dhammas and then to grasp onto them um, as um, evidence that one's actually attained something and then become what we call a vipassana kilesa. So um, Ajahn Chah used to be quite withering about um, people who grasp onto um, these kinds of phenomena or wholesome dhammas as being evidence of enlightenment and saying that um, these days people are um, when they the so called arahants and they have to go and tell everybody um, tell everybody all about it is not like the arahants in the old days and um, who didn't um, didn't make such a big fuss about everything I mean, um, the, the arahants these days uh, make a big nuisance of themselves he's saying I mean arahants in inverted commas not, not real arahants of course but um, the I think the tendency to overestimate um, one's experience in, in meditation is um, is almost impossible to resist um, unless um, you've got someone who's kind of fierce and or, or you've got this constant reminder and um, from the from the beginning it's my nair, it's not it's not sure because we we do have a tendency to think that the more intense an experience is the more real it is and um, this uh, kind of uh, experiences when the mind's very calm impress the mind very very strongly and very deeply um, and have a vividness and a clarity um, that we don't experience in normal waking um, you know, normal waking experience so uh, very compelling and this is why Ajahn Chah was uh, constantly um, telling telling his students don't don't believe any of it don't take it for granted don't um, give it too much importance you say it's it's not sure it's not sure and just bear with it and look at it and examine it um, and learn from it so uh, there's that uh, time when Ajahn Chah went to went to England and um, someone asked him a question that they'd been studying Mahayana Buddhism and and uh, a little bit confused about um, arahants and bodhisattvas and I'm not for sure should I practice to be an arahant or should I practice to be a bodhisattva and Ajahn Shah says don't be any of them at all. don't be an arahant and don't be a bodhisattva don't be anything at all because as soon as you uh, you become something then you're going to suffer so if you're, if you're an arahant you'll suffer and if you're a bodhisattva you'll suffer so just don't be anything at all so this is um, really not what people want to hear very much, but um, these are the, um, as I say, we're so fortunate to um, have either heard ourselves, in my case, fortunate in that way, um, heard or, or heard tapes of or recorded transcripts of, of talks by, um, by monks and teachers who have uh, taken this practice all the way. Um, and these are a great resource to us and um, to be remembered and to be borne in mind um, this is the Pariyati Dhamma the Pariyati Dhamma is that Dhamma which should be learnt and which is of use in uh, Patipati Dhamma the practice of Dhamma um, which leads to Patiweta Dhamma the 
uh, the experience of the realization of the truth. So you now, when we're going to to study, how do we know when what to study, how much to study? Well, whatever uh, leads on to patipati, um, that's that's pariyati, and uh, how to practice, what to practice, and you know, that which leads on to uh, patiwaita, to realization of the of the truth. This is dukkha. This is the cause of dukkha. This is the cessation of dukkha. This is the path leading to the cessation of dukkha. So I would like to offer these few words to you this evening. Was the, the the Buddha Dhamma is the teaching which goes against the stream of craving. This is a teaching in which we um, give up acquisitiveness, desire to um, create some kind of sand wall against the sea. Through um, accumulation of possession, um, charming personality traits, um, skills, and knowledge. This is a teaching which we um, become poorer every day which we um, wear away at uh, our defilement and it's gradually uh, it's gradually wearing away polishing away polishing the rough edges polishing the diamond and it's a I think it's simile uh, for practice we need to have a an enduring mind, a patient mind. Be willing um, to say to yourself or even think, if, if I can just transcend this one hindrance in this lifetime, and I won't have uh, spent my life in vain. I'll come, come down to a really um, basic kind of level, don't get too, too exalted, and because sometimes it can, um, it can boomerang, and can, instead of um, becoming inspired by the goal, um, then you can become depressed by your distance from it. And this is a um, skill in meditation, um, the ability to motivate yourself, the ability to uh, maintain this evenness um, along an uneven path. And um, on certain occasions, it's wise, intelligent to look up, um, to uh, look up to the mountain peaks ahead and see the the glistening peaks and the snow and, and it's very uplifting. Um, other times, um, other moods, other occasions, and it can just seem so far off. You perhaps start to doubt in your ability ever to climb up that high. And then we need to come down to a much more basic uh, kind of level and to um, reflect on the, for instance, the, the purity of our sila, reflect on the, um, the good actions that we perform, the things in our life which we are, which we are proud of, um, which we, which we are sure have been wholesome and, um, beneficial both to ourselves and others. So sometimes um, we can uh, go to the extreme of um, over um, es- 
estimation of ourselves and quite often we go to the other extreme of underestimation. So um, moment by moment there has to be this constant kind of readjustment and seeing what just what the mind needs at any particular moment. Um, just as a, a parent raising a child um, has to vary its ma- uh, the manner, their approach, their words. Um, if they're too kind and um, give the child whatever it wants, then um, the child will become, tend to become a very weak and indulgent child and an adult. On the other hand, if the, the parents are always very harsh and withdraws its love and kindness, then, then the child will um, develop um, in a different way, usually with some kind of uh, neurosis or imbalance in the personality. And uh, with training, training the mind is, is, I think, although I've never raised a child, I think it must be very similar. And um, that kind of sensitivity to what your mind needs rather than what it wants, uh, moment by moment, what's the, what's the right medicine for the mind. When the mind needs encouragement, uh, then having skillful needs to encourage the mind. Uh, when the mind just needs to be damped down a little, uh, just to be reined in a little, um, to be um, still or calm a little more, then having skillful means to do that. Developing um, wide range of more conceptual um, meditations and tools to supplement your basic samatha practice, um, which for most of us is anapanasati. Um, when the mind wanders and becomes distracted, finds um, distraction more valuable, more interesting than meditation objects, um, then we bring it back to the meditation object as soon as we realize. But sometimes there are persistent um, defilements arising and the mind doesn't want to come back. And it's then that you um, need to have some skill at your fingertips. Um, but if, you, if you're diligent, sincere about developing metta pavana uh, every day, uh, then you, you gradually develop um, some perception and you develop um, a, a protection against um, anger and ill will. Begin to find thoughts, cruel thoughts, thoughts of ill will um, as oppressive and and um, ugly and distasteful and a burden on your mind and a stain on your mind. Did you have the brightness of metta to compare it with? Again, the, the uh, reflection on metta is something, um, it's not like a first aid um, treatment. It's, it's something uh, to, to apply when you, you have an outbreak of, um, of anger or ill will. But it's something to be developed um, simultaneously with the main samatha practice every day, morning and evening. And um, so it's there. And if the mind does get very irritable, um, then this is something we can make use of. It's right there. It's a refuge for us. It's a friend. And this is um, something that Ajahn Chah used to used to speak about, saying on the path of samatha practice, um, it's very common to reach a certain level where you get very irritable, um, you get very judgmental, get very irritable with other people, um, angry if people um, upset your meditation. You get very protective 
paranoid about your samadhi and um, and of course there are good um, scriptural authorities for that the Buddha said care for your samadhi nimitta care for your the peace of mind don't let it dissipate, be dissipated um, but at a certain level of practice and it will become very um, critical um, of anything which which might have any kind of detrimental effect on this on this peace that you're trying to to develop and to expand. This is this is one of the defilements of the samatha practitioner, which become um, quite prominent in, in most people. It's a, it's a sign of a certain stage of samatha practice. But uh, one way of, of coping with that or uh, preventing it from from taking over your mind or believing in it too much is this uh, metta, metta practice. Metta and the, um, the karuna practice. In fact, developing all, all four of the Brahma Viharas. Um, sometimes I feel that um, the emphasis on, on metta um, is, is uh, leads people to neglect the other Brahma Viharas, and particularly Mudita. I mean, very few people develop Mudita um, as a meditation, but um, it's a wonderful meditation um, and one in which um, you know, I always say it's it's the it's the lazy man's path to enlightenment, if you like, because. You don't actually have to do anything. You just sort of appreciate whatever the people are doing. You can just sort of sit back and watch and, and enjoy it. And, uh, but it's it's not an easy thing to do for for many people. But uh, when you become uh, that uh, that appreciation of goodness, then um, just as if you become interested um, in anything, uh, your mind goes to that. For instance, if you if you study about um, plant life or herbs, you walk into a forest, you know, and you know, all that you can make into a medicine, and this you can make into a medicine, and that's this tree and this is that tree, and you know that's what you that's what you notice. Um, um, when you develop mudita, you become extremely sensitive to goodness and good intentions of other people, and that can replace or um, um, override the kind of more negative or cynical um, kinds of um, reactions uh, that uh, are, are quite deeply ingrained in many people. But, um, it's a way of uh, not. It's a way of recognizing, opening your eyes to just how much goodness there is around us. Um, particularly in a, in a monastic community, of course, you know, this, it's not very difficult at all to see um, goodness in every every part of the day. Um, it's very unusual to see anything else, really. Um, but even with the 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 lay community or or um, in the world, just to, uh, the sometimes it can the path the mind goes to the path of or, or this sense of sober sadness at the superficiality and pointlessness. So going out to the world, being out, out of the monastery this afternoon, seeing, seeing both sides of that, my mind just one, my mind tends to go between these two poles. The one just is the sense of, oh, just people just so caught up in this, in this drama and in this foolishness. And then at the same time, just seeing quite a lot of just small acts of kindness, not not just but to myself, but uh, but just on the street, just uh, one person um, dropping something, and somebody else um, just calling to them and saying you've dropped something, and giving it to them, and the person who receives it just smiling and saying thank you. You know, these kind of little vignettes, you see, just normal everyday life. But what a, what a lovely thing that was! And you know, there's no reason why someone should should tell somebody that they dropped something and go to the bother of picking it up and giving it back to them. But it's just it's 
just a beautiful thing and, and that human beings do do things like that. I didn't want any kind of reward for it. And it just just an obvious thing to do. So developing this mood uh, <laughs> and ability just to recognize the bodhisattva practice. Um, but it, you know, it's like quality of life in a community is based on these these little these tiny little building bricks of goodness that we that we all contribute. And this external care, attention, goodness, um, um, matures um, in our practice as well, and the ability to um, develop this brightness of mind, and just being willing to um, go along with the ups and downs, and, and gradually working with them. It's like massaging them. You know, so you've got a you've got an ache or a pain. You start massaging; it's not going to go away straight away. You have to keep working with it, and and finding the right the right technique and the right way of, of dealing with it. So on the on the path of, of samatha, the, the mind's always it's like walking a tightrope. You know, it's always going to tend to be going off from one side to the other, and go off in the side of indulgence in sexual feelings, sexual thoughts, proliferating. Taking up some some um, something you've seen, something you've heard, some memory, and just uh, uh, developing it, and the mind is fascinated by it, and it's reborn in that little realm for a while, and uh, being able to deal with that, and not getting angry. With, if you get angry with yourself when you do that, um, then you're just making matters worse. That's not a constructive way. Um, of dealing with defilements or hindrances. Intelligent way it was just as if you're driving a car and you've gone down the wrong road. You know, you stop, turn round, and uh, get back onto the main road as quickly and safely as you can. That's all right. You've never been on this road before. It's quite natural that you should take wrong turns every now and again. But uh, once you realise, you know, you don't want to go further off your road than. Um, uh, the necessary, you want to get back as quickly as you can, you've got a long way to go and maybe it's going to get dark soon so um, the mind goes off into the way of negativity and then you, you, you're, you're massaging that with the metta that you've, that you've developed the mind's going off the way of agitation, so you find ways of calming the mind the mind's going the way of dullness then to energize the mind if the sleepiness and, and dullness um, tends to be the, the major kind of problem for monastics because it's, it's the defilement of, uh, of passivity, of gentleness. Gentle, passive people tend to um, fall into dull states unless you need that kind of more kind of aggressive, um, uh, forceful kind of energy. So this, this is something that you have to be able to... to um, Access the word is these days, isn't it? Don't be able to um, tap into that kind of energy, and um, you know, the beginning of the meditation period, just to just to look at your mind and uh, what kind of state is it in? Does it feel basically um, peaceful? Looking forward to meditation? I really wanting to sort of penetrate deeply with the meditation or is there some kind of resistance there or do, do, you, do you feel a kind of dullness already and, uh, or is you, are you quite agitated and, and prepare yourself there's probably going to be one or other of the, of the hindrances going to manifest itself um, most strongly predominantly um, in the meditation unless you're beyond the hindrances altogether and so to prepare for that and to make some certain resolutions in your mind and to and to be very clear about your your purpose in meditating and your purpose is not to um, to indulge in um, distraction not to be carried away not to fall into the bog of dullness uh, not to go on the roundabouts of 
agitation. But you want to be right there in the present, sustaining the attention in the present moment on your meditation object uh, with um, the recollection of the object and the self-awareness, the clear comprehension of uh, uh, of Sampajanya. I, I always like the, the simile of the, of the man walking um, with the uh, big pot of um, oil or, or some kind of fluid. Um, and he has to walk along this very um, difficult, windy, bumpy path um, without spilling any of the liquid. I think maybe he has a man walking behind him with a big sword. Anyway, it's very important to him that he doesn't um, drop any of this liquid. Um, now, if you imagine yourself in that position, you, you, you've got to try to walk along this um, bumpy, difficult path with, with this carrying this big bowl of fluid in front of you, a big bowl of oil, uh, without letting it, uh, any of it uh, be lost. Where would your attention be? Well, most probably attention is mainly on on the on the pot to just to keep trying to keep it as stable as you can, and not to not to um, let it tip or else some some of the oil will be lost. But at the same time, uh, you can't completely um, ignore the state of the road because you have to avoid certain potholes. Um, you have to try to keep on the path. So every now and again you probably just glance up ahead and just see if there are any obstacles up ahead, what's the state of the path, um, and then come back to your main object of attention, which is the pot of oil. So you could say maybe you're with the pot of oil 80% of the time, and then 20% of the time you're just glancing ahead, just checking out the path, checking out are you still on the path, are you walking straight, um, are there any dangerous obstacles ahead, is there any problem arising? And, um, and this is the the, is the simile um, of developing meditation with sati, the the recollection of the or the attention on the on the pot of oil in sampajanya. Um, it's just this kind of just withdrawing from that for a moment and just generally seeing the whole context of what you're doing um, and the generally um, how your how your recollection of the object um, is affected by. Um, other things that are happening, or um, are there any obstacles arising or hindrances arising in the mind? Um, are there any problems coming up? So maintaining the um, mindfulness um, in all postures, the Chanchar's words, and um, Viriya doesn't reside in the posture, Viriya resides in the mind. Changing the posture is just changing the posture. Um, but just uh, adapt, adapting the practice of mindfulness. Um, you're not ending the practice of mindfulness with the end of the meditation period. It's only through the ability to maintain a kind of clarity and uh, non-distraction of mind um, through the non-meditation period. Um, that the meditation periods themselves are, are enriched and um, are powerful. <coughs> the way of <coughs> the way of practice. Um, it's usually a, a, a rocky um, or thorny path for most of us. And at the same time, I'm <coughs> reminded of um, words of wisdom that uh, I received from my parents when I was small. And one of them I, I often think of my father always telling me to sit up straight and um, realizing what wise and profound advice that was I didn't I didn't used to appreciate it when I was a teenager and 
<clears throat> another another um, another phrase that springs to mind is uh, count your blessings. And, um, probably most English people have heard that, and um, I think in a, in this environment particularly, you know, it's a very good um, practice um, to count count your blessings and to be so much that it's so easy to take for granted um, the fact that we're that we're fed every day we have cookies to live in um, that we have uh, good friends um, if we reflect on these things um, constantly then our discontent um, with the progress that uh, we're making or not making in practices is very much reduced and just to see how much the blessings that we do have and um, we don't have to compromise uh, we're not we don't feel strange or freakish in wanting to get up at three in the morning and um, meditate and we can do things like not talk for two or three weeks or uh, fast for a couple of weeks and nobody's going to think us strange or weird in fact uh, people support us encourage us praise us for doing things like this um, can even refrain from laying down for a month or two months or three months and nobody thinks that's strange so we have a great deal of freedom um, to do that which is which is uh, our heart's deepest desire that which we um, most want to do and we can we can do that in a monastery so at the same time as in uh, conventional sense um, our life is a very constrained one but it is through that external constraint um, that we learn or we come to experience an inner freedom so there are so many um, contributory factors and causes to um, progress or regress in in practice but developing this uh, warm and spacious heart and recognition um, of our blessings and the things that we've been given um, and most basically at all been given this life um, so even if your your parents were cruel and heartless and and treated you in, in terrible ways or abandoned you on a, a rubbish tip or uh, whatever then at the very least they, uh, they gave you this human life which is so incredibly precious and the fact that you're, you're here and that you're able to uh, practice Buddhist teachings is because of your, your parents um, so this is um, you know, where we have these um, chants at the end of, of every uh, the morning and the evening session where we share our merits particularly uh, with our parents for all that they've given us So that um, counting our blessings, counting um, the the things that we uh, we are given, and counting the things, the small victories that we've achieved, um, the goodness that we've uh, created and shared with others, um, is a way of giving your mind a real um, cushion um, and a basic sense of well-being uh, which enables you to bear with the ups and downs of, of practice the 
the difficult times, the disappointments, the disillusionments um, that that inevitably come. And there is a point, I think, in everyone's practice where you realise this is there's a lot more to this than I thought. You know, this is a lot bigger job than than I thought. You know, this isn't just a um, a ten day retreat job. You know, this is ten years, twenty years, thirty years, if we're lucky. And this is this is why I feel that the um, the acceptance of well, the faith in the Buddhist teachings of samsara uh, are so helpful. Some some monks, some some people say you know, take the agnostic view. You know, don't don't worry about the sort of other realms, past lives, future lives. You know, just concentrate on the present present life, and that sounds quite reasonable. But at the same time, you're your attitude to the teachings of, of samsara affects your attitude to your present life. And if you um, believe that you've been born many, 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 many lifetimes, then 10 years or 20 years of meditation practice, or 30 years or 40 years, it's, it's, uh, it's the blink of an eye. Um, if you take one life, then, wow, having to do this for five years or ten years, uh, it's a really big deal. Mm. But that's, that's basing, that, that view is based on my view of just one lifetime, isn't it? Counting your blessings, then you feel, well, there's nothing else I'd rather do anyway. <laughs> 